All right, here we go. Our final two sections, not just of unit six, but the entire course. Section 6.4 is about the effects of government intervention in different market structures, i.e. monopolistic market structures. We've only looked at perfectly competitive market structures up to this point. We want to see what happens when the government decides to intervene in a monopolistic market. And then we'll finish with section 6.5 by talking a little bit about inequality in economics. First of all, let's take a visit back to unit two of the course, because as we're talking about taxes and subsidies in a perfectly competitive market, we should remember that we've actually already talked about how these play out in a market before. Back in unit two, we looked at a per unit tax and discussed how the logic behind this from the government standpoint, is that by taxing producers, society will benefit. If they're increasing the cost of production on, say, tobacco and alcohol, then society will benefit because there will be less of these items in the market that are causing negative externalities. Now, at the time, we didn't really talk about externalities. I didn't want to start throwing that at you quite yet because I knew we'd be visiting it in Unit 6, but the point is, you already know and have shown in previous units and on previous tests that you know how this works out. We have a higher marginal private cost. The supply curve shifts upward. Price goes up. Quantity goes down. There's a higher price paid by consumers. But remember, there's a lower net price received by sellers. So that gap between the price being paid by consumers and what sellers end up getting, that's the difference that's collected by the government. You can see this play out in the market graph, where the blue equilibrium is our original equilibri equilibrium, and then the government imposes the per unit tax. So the supply curve actually shifts up the amount of that tax. That's important. The per unit value of the tax determines how much the supply curve shifts. And notice, that's not what determines the equilibrium change, right? That just determines the shift in the supply curve without the tax and with the tax, before and after. So the red equilibrium is our new equilibrium in the market. And the price is higher and the quantity is lower, but that's the equilibrium price and quantity. That's what consumers are paying and that's how many units uh, consumers are buying. But... Whereas consumer surplus and producer surplus both have now changed, so has not just the price received, excuse me, paid by, by consumers, but the price received by producers. Because of the tax, producers are not getting a price of P2. That's the price paid by consumers, but the net price received by sellers is the price after we take into account that per unit tax, right? The price paid by bu buyers, P2, minus the tax. So what's left in producer surplus is what's down here because they're only getting this price and these are the only producers who are left in the market that are willing to accept this low of a price or even lower in the case of these producers down here on the supply curve. So consumer surplus is up here. That's what's left over. Producer surplus down here. And in the middle is this government tax revenue. Now, at the time, because we weren't talking about externalities, keep in mind, if there was no externality in this market that was calling for this to happen, then this area right here, this triangle that's just uh, filled in with white right now, would be dead weight loss. When there's an externality, though, a negative one, this is actually what society wants to happen. They wanted there to be less of this good, right? And that's ideally why the government would impose that tax. Now, does it always work out like that? No. Is it always perfect, even if that's the way society wants things to go? Even if they want there to be less of this item, is it always perfect? No. But it's important to understand that if there's no externality, and the government steps into this market where they were you know, fine and dandy and happy at equilibrium and now they're not, 
there will be dead weight loss caused by this per unit tax. Either way, dead weight loss or not, there's some government tax revenue and consumer surplus and producer surplus have both changed. The price paid by buyers has changed and the net price received by sellers has also changed. And those two things are different because of the value of the tax. So a per unit subsidy is just the opposite, right? By subsidizing producers, society will benefit. An example we gave was education. And this is going back to unit two. These are the same slides that we looked at back then. There will be a lower marginal cost, which will shift the cost curve downward, which really means that the equilibrium price will decrease and the quantity will increase because it's less, it's costing less for producers to generate this good, to actually make this good. And uh, so there's a lower price paid by consumers. That's good for us as consumers. And there's a higher price received by sellers. How is that possible? because of the subsidy. That difference is what the government is paying in terms of the per unit subsidy. So as we look at this on a graph, once again, you have the private market as it is. There's the price, there's the quantity, there's consumer surplus and producer surplus. But if the government decides to subsidize producers, that's decreasing this marginal cost per unit, that's marginal subsidy that's decreasing the cost. So we're going to see a downward shift. Remember, this is the per unit value of the subsidy. And that could be measured at any vertical distance between these two curves because they're parallel to one another. So if you had, say, this value on the y-axis and then this value right here, which it looks like we do, yeah, then you could measure the per unit value of this subsidy. So Here's our new equilibrium. Here's the new quantity and price. And so the price paid by buyers has gone down to P2, but we have to take into account the full subsidy. It's pretty clear when you look at this per unit subsidy, the dis distance between these two curves, that the price difference from PE to P2 is not that full distance. So the rest of this subsidy is going to the producers, the sellers. And this would be the total cost of the subsidy to the government. Now remember, the impact of all of this, as we look at uh, the, the price change from the equilibrium to P2 to the net price that's being received by sellers, much of that depends on elasticity. Here's what I mean by that. Right now, we have the same supply curve in both graphs. And let's say each market is provided with the same exact per unit subsidy. Those arrows are exactly the same. Here's our new supply curve. But as you can already see, because of the demand curve, which is very different in either graph in terms of elasticity, it's more unit elastic on the left. And on the right, it's relatively inelastic. It's very vertical. So it's inelastic, not perfectly, but relatively. But it makes a big difference. Look at the equilibrium changes. And more importantly, look at the changes in price. So in the market where demand is relatively inelastic, that price changes by a whole lot more than in the market where it's basically unit elastic. Right, And because of that, more or less of a tax or subsidy is going to get passed along to the consumer versus the producer. That is going to impact the difference in the new price paid by the consumer and the net price that, that producers end up getting. Elasticity makes all the difference. So let's use an example. Okay, Let's say uh, we have a situation like this. And there is a negative externality. You can see that the marginal social cost is above the marginal private cost. This is a negative externality. So here's the quantity that exists in the market. And the price in the market is $2. But the equilib uh, socially optimal equilibrium would be here, right? At a price of $3 and less units in the market at QSO. So 
there's a negative externality. Society wants there to be less. So the question is, how much of a tax should be imposed in this market in order to achieve the socially optimal outcome? It's not just what do we need to do anymore, okay? We learned in section 6.2 that this requires a per unit tax to fix the dead weight loss associated with this market, which would be right here, okay? This area that I'm outlining with the cursor would be our dead weight loss. But more importantly, we need the equilibrium to get to here. And the easy thing to do is say, oh, well, it's a dollar because the equilibrium price now is two and we want it to be three. But remember, that's just the difference in price. It's actually the distance between the two curves that we're talking about in terms of what we need for a per unit tax. We need the supply curve to go from where it is now to where the marginal social cost curve is. So that's kind of what your hint on the left says here. How much do we need the curve to shift upward? If you look at this distance, between the two curves and then follow that point over to the y-axis, we don't need a $1 tax, we need a $2 tax because the distance can be measured here given what I've just given you as two to $4. Now, let's say you had some other way to measure this vertical distance like maybe here at these two points, you could go over to the y-axis and see, uh, I don't know, 50 cents and 250 or something like that. It's still good because it's measuring $2, right? What we know in this case, after seeing that distance that would be required to get to this equilibrium that would be socially optimal is that the per unit tax needs to be $2. So it's not just the change in equilibrium. It's not just the change in price. It's the total per unit tax. This market would require a $2 per unit tax to become socially optimal, to get rid of that inefficiency. What about lump sum taxes and subsidies? We've talked a lot about per unit, but what about lump sum? Well, remember, per unit essentially means margin. We've talked all year about marginal cost, marginal revenue, marginal benefit, marginal product, this, that. That's just per unit. Lump sum means total. And that's really what sum means, right? Uh, in mathematics, for example, it's, it's just total. So we, we've added everything up. It's a lump sum. So per unit taxes and subsidies impact the marginal cost, but... A lump sum tax or subsidy only affects the average total cost curve. Per unit can impact marginal cost, marginal private cost, that sort of thing. And, and we've seen um, and we're going to continue to see how that's impacted different markets. But we haven't talked about lump sum taxes and subsidies yet. So let's look at both of these things in not a perfectly competitive market, but now a monopolistic market. In a monopolistic market, here's your rule. If we're talking about a per unit tax or subsidy, it affects the marginal cost curve. Because remember, in a monopolistic market, we have marginal cost and average cost curves. So we have to know which one we're dealing with, which one we're shifting in some way. If it's a per unit tax or subsidy, it's the marginal cost curve. This affects both the output and the price being charged by the firm. It's going to determine how they change their production and what they charge for their good. This is because if we're messing with the marginal cost curve, that's impacting the marginal principle. It's changing the point where the marginal cost curve intersects with the marginal revenue curve. On the other hand, a lump sum tax or subsidy is only going to affect the average total cost curve. And in that case, the only thing ATC determines in any way is profit or loss. It has nothing to do with output or price because those things are determined by the marginal principle. So here's what that looks like on a graph. In this particular graph, there are uh, two examples being shown, and they're both 
taxing a monopolistic market. If the marginal cost curve is being affected versus the average cost curve, we just know one is per unit marginal and one is lump sum. That would be the average total cost curve. So if a per unit tax is imposed on this monopoly, check out what happens. Initially, this was marginal cost. So it meets marginal revenue here. And so our socially optimal output was X, or excuse me, our profit maximizing output was X and our profit maximizing price was P. After the tax though, that marginal cost curve is now up here. So the profit maximizing output becomes Q or excuse me, X1 and the profit maximizing price becomes P1. Now, when we have a lump sum tax, it just moves the average cost curve upward. That doesn't impact in any way where the marginal cost curve is intersecting with the marginal revenue curve. In other words, it doesn't change our profit maximizing output or price. It just changes, in this case, the amount of profit that we're earning. So average cost is only useful in determining profit or loss or break even. It does not help us in determining output or price. What about subsidizing a monopolistic market? It's just the opposite. So if it was a per unit subsidy, the marginal cost curve would shift downward. And as you can see, when this was the marginal cost curve, it hit the marginal revenue curve here. So the profit maximizing output was Q and the profit maximizing price was up here. Okay, but now because they've been granted a subsidy, they're going to not only produce more Q2 because that's now where the marginal cost curve intersects with the marginal revenue curve and the price will decrease as a result. And that's exactly what the government wanted. Right? If you think about a monopoly, they artificially decrease output. They keep output artificially restricted and keep the price jacked up. They have this monopolistic power. But if the government subsidizes them, it's encouraging the monopoly to increase output and potentially to the socially optimal output to fix all of those inefficiencies and in doing so, decrease price as well. The average cost curve is only affected by lump sum. So if we get a lump sum subsidy, it will decrease that ATC curve. Now, even though that only affects profit or loss, that's still a big deal, right? You can see that in this case, before the lump sum subsidy, this ATC curve was way up here. This monopolist was incurring a loss. But now, after the lump sum subsidy, it is way down here. And they're actually earning a little bit of profit or potentially uh, breaking even, right? That, that might be why the ATC curve is shifted downward. That might be why the lump sum subsidy is offered to cover the losses essentially for that firm to encourage them to stay in business because sometimes these monopolies are very important. They might be like utilities, right? Things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis and the government certainly doesn't want to um, let those sort of companies die. So they might offer subsidies. All right, so main takeaway, a per unit tax and subsidy impacts the marginal cost curve, whereas a lump sum tax or subsidy impacts the average total cost curve. And you should be able to manage your way through these questions if you can remember that basic distinction there. What about a natural monopoly? A natural monopoly is a market in which the ATC curve is constantly decreasing. So if we wanted this firm to produce the socially optimal quantity of Q1, that would be difficult to uh, make that argument because at that point, the price would be P1, but our ATC curve is above that price. So this firm would be incurring losses by producing the socially optimal output. How could the government fix that? By offering a lump sum subsidy and shifting that ATC curve downward to erase that loss for the firm. So... In any of these cases, 
at the end of the day, the government might solve this inefficiency in the market. They might not. Sometimes there are different levels of effectiveness, whether it's with taxes and subsidies or floors and ceilings or quotas or minimum wage laws or whatever it might be. Sometimes they fix the inefficiency in the market. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they fix part of it, but there are unintended consequences. And it's really hard to predict all of the results, right? All of the consequences that will come from the implementation of these policies. But at least now you have an understanding of the basic justification and the goals of these policies that we've talked about, not just in unit six, but in previous units as well. All right, our fifth and final section of unit six is inequality. And basically, one of the main reasons for inequality in terms of wealth or income is this idea that workers or factors of production are compensated based on their marginal revenue product. Well, marginal revenue product can be vastly different from industry to industry, firm to firm. So that can contribute to income inequality. And even though that's just a model and that doesn't always play out exactly like we discuss it conceptually in the real world, there are other things that can contribute to income inequality, whether it's different tax structures, social capital that one has or does not have, inheritance one receives or does not receive, discrimination that one might face access to capital, access to different markets, bargaining power, any of these things might contribute to income inequality or wealth inequality. We measure this essentially in two ways in economics. One is through the Lorenz curve, two is through the Gini coefficient, which is a statistical representation. The Lorenz curve is a graph and you can see it here. The curve in the middle, that's 45 degrees, is the line of equality. It is measuring a perfect distribution of income. So basically, the farther out we get from that, the more inequality there is in this society. The more this curve gets pulled toward this corner where the y and x axis meet, the greater amount of wealth is held by a smaller share of the population or a smaller number of households in the society. And then those spaces are actually used to calculate the Gini coefficient, which you can see here in this formula, but you will never be asked to do that. So, yay. All right, we are all done with not just unit six, but the entire course. And that should make you feel pretty good. Nice job, that's it. We'll have a checkpoint to go with this tomorrow, but for today, you are all done. So thank you as always for tuning in. And I will see you with one last video before our nice two-week break tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone.